In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Welcome back to all of our Institute of Catholic Culture friends and family here for our 20th Sunday in Ordinary Time, otherwise known as the 10th Sunday after Pentecost. And of course, I keep bringing that up each week because we it's easy to lose sight of the season in which we're living and why the church is focusing our attention on these particular passages each Sunday regarding mission. And here as we've been talking in the past few weeks about the challenges to our mission as Christians, the church goes uh, head on with this, this idea of suffering and the suffering that we endure for the sake of Christ. And so we're going to dive into that, talk about authentic peace, a bit of the history of suffering as we're seeing the prophet Jeremiah as a way to strengthen us for the challenges we, we face. We'll look at the responsorial Psalm and so forth. So let me give you the biblical text. Jeremiah chapter 38. Jeremiah 38, verse 4 through 6 and 8 through 10. So we skip a couple verses in the middle. Psalm 40. John 10, 27 is the Alleluia verse. Uh, the gospel is Luke chapter 12, verse 49 through 53. And the epistle is Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 through 4. So, Father Sebastian, let's jump right in here to the prophet Jeremiah. Everybody's got their Bible out. Father Sebastian, you got your Bible, I know. You got it right there. Nice real book. That's it. And, uh, and here we are. So, Jeremiah chapter 38, starting with verse 4. In those days, the princes said to the king, Jeremiah ought to be put to death. He is demoralizing the soldiers who are left in this city and all the people by speaking such things to them. He is not interested in the welfare of our people, but in their ruin. King Zedekiah answered, he is in your power for the king could do nothing with them. And so they took Jeremiah and threw him into the cistern of the prince Malkia, which is in the quarters of the guard, letting him down with ropes. There was no water in the cistern, only mud, and Jeremiah sank into the mud. Ebed-Melech, a court official, went there from the palace and said to him, My lord king, these men have been at fault in all they have done to the prophet Jeremiah, casting him into the cistern. He will die of famine on the spot, for there is no more food in the city. Then the king ordered Ebed-Melech, the Cushite, to take three men along with him and draw the prophet Jeremiah out of the cistern before he should die. Father Sebastian, this is one of those classic verses that 95, or text that 95% of people walking into uh, Mass this Sunday will have no idea what's going on because of biblical illiteracy. Now, I know, Institute of Catholic Culture friends, you know what's going on here, but we're going to, Father Sebastian, you're going to contextualize it for us. Before he does, I want to just ask you, this is what should be going on in your head when you hear a text like this, because you're not always going to have Father Sebastian at your side to tell you. You got to say to yourself, wait a minute, when did Jeremiah live? What was his mission? Who was he talking to? Okay, then now it's all going to come together because, you know, texts like this, where it says that there was no more food in the city, this is important. You should be able to know why is there no more food in the city? Okay, it should be right, right at the forefront. And it probably is, but Father Sebastian should make sure we're all on the same page. Give us the context here of Jeremiah. So Jeremiah is a pre exilic slash exilic prophet. So he was prophesying before the Babylonians conquered Jerusalem and destroyed the temple. That was in 587 approximately when it happened. So uh, the last king on the throne of the line of David ruling there in Jerusalem was King Zedekiah that we hear about in this story. And we can read more about this at the end of second Kings. If people want to read chapters 24 and 25 of Second Kings, they can hear a little bit more of the historical background to what was going on at this time. Zedekiah is on the throne. The Babylonians have already turned Jerusalem and Judea into a vassal. They're paying their taxes, but Zedekiah, the king, has started to rebel against the Babylonians, and Jeremiah warns them and says, don't rebel against the Babylonians. This is the chastisement upon you for your polytheism, for worshiping other gods. God is chastising you 
And, and he's using the Babylonians as that chastisement. So if you rebel against the Babylonians and don't pay the taxes and don't do it, then you're actually rebelling against God's punishment and chastisement of you. And so therefore, God's going to come in and just wipe this place out. So this is, your, this is a, an opportunity for you to repent and accept the, the punishment that you deserve. Well, this was not politically popular type of speech to, to say that some foreign nation will come and destroy the city, will come and destroy the temple and all of and that the king is, needs to submit and pay their taxes. So, so the, the people who supported Zedekiah in Zedekiah's rebellion were against Jeremiah. And this is that group we hear about here who throw him into this cistern, into a pit that was intended to hold water. They threw him into this pit and there's sediment, mud, you know, dirt down there. And of course, he's not going to survive long like that. And thank God, somebody, as we read through the book of Jeremiah, every time this kind of thing happens to Jeremiah, somebody says, hey, you know, I think we're going to do hard on the guy. So they let him out. In this case, this happens also. You know, I encourage all of you, all of our participants to do exactly what Father Sebastian just did. And that is go back and read the final chapters of Second Kings, uh, maybe the last three chapters of Second Kings. But also, this is, a, this is an opportunity for a, a big uh, learning lesson for us to remind ourselves of how to read the prophets, and that is always be in the historical context. Jeremiah is one of those great examples of that, in which you have more detail about what was going on historically in the prophet. A lot of times we think of the prophet as kind of the guy who's just out there, the word of the Lord said, you know, this kind of stuff. But, but actually, there's historical context given in the prophet. The first thing you want to do is go to the beginning of the prophecy. So the very first verses of the prophet are going to, nine times out of ten, are going to give you that historical context in which it's given. Maybe it's ten out of ten. I don't know, Father Sebastian. Probably on every single prophet it's like this. Look at this. The beginning of, the, of Jeremiah. The words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, the priest, who were in Anathoth, in the land of Benjamin, in whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah. In the thirteenth year of his reign, it came also in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, and until the end of the eleventh year of, here it is, Zedekiah, who we're just talking about, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, until the captivity of Jerusalem in the fifth month. So there's your context. You've got to go back to Second Kings and read those, the time period of those kings. You're going to find them back there in Second Kings, those particular guys. Read that section at the end of Second Kings that deals with the lives of those kings then go and read the prophet Jeremiah, and you're going to have the context. In these chapters that we're, we're seeing here in chapter 38, but you can go back before that to chapter 34 through 38, really is a gold mine of historical information about this time period. But the church here is, of course, as I said before, focusing our attention on this time of Pentecost, in which, in which we're called to go out and tell the truth. A prophet is one who says the truth about God. Okay, he's not always like, we were thinking about him as a fortune teller. It's not, it's not a fortune teller, you know. He's, he's telling the truth about God, about, about the situation, the way things are. The prophet is able to see the, life, the place in which he's living and perceive in it more than, say, meets the eye. <laughs> to say the truth about why the things are happening around us. And Jeremiah, of course, is telling them that. Get yourselves right with God. Otherwise, you're going to die, right? You're going you're gonna, to you're gonna go into exile. There's going to be, as you said, Father, there's going to be this the foreigner is going to come and take you away from the house of God because you're living like one of them. And you can no longer live in the house of God unless you're living according to the ways of those who, of the ways of the family, if you will. So Jeremiah is saying this, get your, you know, repent, get your lives in order. They refuse and they're eventually taken away. That's all given to us then in the context of Pentecost in which we're sent out on mission and need to be able to perceive the reality, the truths of, around us, why society is the way it is, and then to be able to speak the truth in that situation. I'm going to find that in the gospel very much. Is it, it very much comes home in the gospel. Uh, literally, it comes home. We chant the responsorial psalm, Lord, come to my aid. So there's this sense that there's an uh, attack going on, and that we're calling upon the Lord, who is the only, you know, our only strength. Beautiful 
image I've mentioned before, the icon of the resurrection. We're going to pull this icon up here on the screen. And you'll notice this is that here's Jesus of the resurrection. And uh, these two people down below are Adam and Eve. You'll notice the chains are being broken off. The chains of, of death are being are, are loosed. And so they're broken off. And notice how Jesus is holding Adam's hand or arm. And this is intentional that, Adam's hand is not actually grasping Christ's hand. It's Christ's hand who's grasping Adam's arm because it's by the strength and power of God that we are assisted in the time of trial. The Lord stands waiting for us to take hold of us and to restore us to safety. And Jeremiah is a good example of this in the Old Testament reading that we have. Okay, Father Sebastian, let's take a look at the gospel reading this coming Sunday in chapter 12 verse 49, chapter 12, verse 49. Maybe I just mention one more thing about this responsorial psalm. This has been a consistent theme of the Lord is our strength. Lord, come to my aid. And to realize that when we're chanting this this coming Sunday, by the way, if you're not singing these parts of the liturgy, we got a problem. So when you hear the choir start singing this, the Lord, come to my aid, you should be internalizing this and singing this with them. So that this reality of the Lord who is the helper of mankind is true in your life. And you reaffirm that this coming Sunday in church to, to rely upon him rather than rely upon the things of this world. Luke chapter 12, verse 49 through 53. This is not one of those, you know, Birkenstocks, uh, uh, braided hair Jesus moments. This is a little bit more fire and brimstone here, Father Sebastian. Luke chapter 12, verse 49. Jesus said to his disciples, I have come to set the earth on fire, and how I wish it were already blazing. There is a baptism with which I must be baptized, and how great is my anguish until it is accomplished. Do you think that I have come to establish peace on earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. From now on, a household of five will be divided, three against two and two against three. A father will be divided against his son and a son against his father. A mother against her daughter and a daughter against her mother. A mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. There you go. Have a nice day. <laughs> There's our gospel this coming Sunday. Not very inspiring, Father Sebastian. Maybe you could give us the context here. Ian Luke, why is Jesus... Uh, you know, I think peace on earth, men of goodwill. I mean, the angels are singing. This is not, this is not Jesus, you know, the baby Jesus in the cradle anymore. We've got, this, this is a tough, tough teaching. I'm not come to bring peace, uh, but division. What's he talking about? Why is he saying this? Well, context is everything, like you said. So this is in Luke's gospel. This is after the transfiguration. So if we recall for our audience, we've done a lot of studies in this regard. The Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, have basically two parts to them. Aside from an introduction and a conclusion, the body of the Synoptic Gospel story, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, is structured basically the same. It begins with the baptism of the Lord, and the, the first part of it, and concludes with Caesarea Philippi. So what was said at the baptism this is my son, and the Spirit descends, showing him to be the long-awaited, anointed king, the Messiah. Mm -hmm. That is then, we hear the, the disciples then agree with that, attest to that, after three years of ministry at Caesarea Philippi, when Jesus says in the, you know, their oral exam, okay, boys, you know, what, what do you think? What do you say? And they proclaim Jesus as the Christ, the long-awaited Messiah, the Son of God. And so then it, it, we hear from that moment, Jesus begins to turn towards Jerusalem. And from, uh, from that point forward, we begin part two of the Synoptic story, which starts with the transfiguration, which is parallel to the baptism story in many ways. The transfiguration, where they now see that the Jesus of Nazareth, who they now have realized is the long-awaited earthly Messiah, the son of David, they now begin to realize at the transfiguration, or at least starts to be revealed, that Jesus of Nazareth, the long way to Messiah, is actually also the long way, the return of the, of the divine king to them. They were waiting for the return of 
the two kings, the heavenly king and the earthly king. And so Jesus now reveals that to them. Just like in the baptism, there was a revelation. Now at the transfiguration, there's a revelation of the apostles. And then the second half of the gospel then is going to go, it's going to go about revealing that, just like the first half revealed what was initially shown at baptism. And so what we see at that, the baptism is clearly in the mouth of disciples at Caesarea Philippi. What we see at the transfiguration, we see shining forth in the resurrection stories at the end of the gospel. And so in just following the transfiguration is where we are here in Luke's gospel. Jesus is now heading to Jerusalem. The second half of the gospel is pointing toward Jerusalem, Jesus' is coming death, and his resurrection. And so there's a lot of intensity, a lot of conflict, and Jesus is preparing the disciples for that. Down in Galilee, it was it was nice. You know, there was there it was it's nice in Galilee. And there were there weren't there wasn't so much conflict there. But as he goes to Jerusalem, you're heading into the political center of these people, the religious center of these people. You've got Herod, you've got Pontius Pilate, you have the, the Pharisees, the Sadducees. There's a lot of intensity. And when Jesus arrives there, as we see in the gospel, there is instant conflict. And so Jesus is preparing the disciples for this, that, that he is coming not to bring peace, but division. And what he means by that is that, that people are going to have to make a choice. Are they, do they accept that Jesus is who he says he is and who he's revealed to be? Or are they going to reject that? Or are they going to accept that and take upon their shoulders the persecution that might come with it? Their own father might might persecute them. Their own son might persecute them. Their own brother or sister, members of their own household, they're going to have to make a decision. And that was going on in the first century and, and continued intensely for those early Jewish Christians as families were divided over who is Jesus and some put their own siblings to death. Yeah. You know, I've, um, I, 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 in preparing for our time together, I, I remember this, this verse from the gospel of John, which is given at the same time period in his ministry. He says, peace, I leave you. My peace, I give you. Not as the world gives, do I give it to you. There's this distinction between the peace of the world and authentic peace, the peace of God. St. John Chrysostom, commenting on this verse, says, What sort of peace is it that Jesus brings? And what kind of peace is it that the angels sing? Glory to God in the highest and peace on earth. If Jesus did not come to bring peace, then why did all the prophets publish peace as good news? Because this is because this more than anything is peace. When the disease is removed, when the cancer is cut away with the sword. We have to remember that authentic peace is a matter of a relationship. And Jesus is coming to to confront a, a problem. And the problem is a, a divided relationship, a breaking apart of our relationship with God. And he has come to, in some sense, surgically resolve the problem. <laughs> From the world's standpoint, what Jesus is doing, it does not look like peace at all. It's not a matter of getting along. He is restoring, in a true way, our relationship uh, with God. St. Saint Apollinarius, writing in the second century as a martyr, says this, the, unbelieving, the unbeliever's disagreement with the believer will produce a distinction. Since the unbelievers think that peacemaking is the proper duty, they say, do not believe that it is best in all circumstances to be saved, for you owe it as a duty to be at peace with all. This is the world's peace that Jesus does not come to give, and that is that, is that, that my relationship with my neighbor is a matter of kind of calmness or, or not having a fight. Well, Certainly, Jesus comes to restore that relationship, but only by way of authentic truth in our relationship with God. How important that is, because we're under attack so often as Christians. And again, I say this in context of the 10th Sunday of Pentecost. We go out into the world as Christians, and we preach the truth of Jesus Christ, and we are oftentimes under attack. We're told not to do that, right? Religion has no place in the public fear in, the, in our conversations in the store and with our co-worker don't talk about religion 
my brothers and sisters, we are Christians. And that means we are anointed by God for this very ministry. And when we don't do it, then Christ is not present in our society. We, we absolutely must reject this idea that we cannot speak in public about our, our, our faith. I'm going to give you one last, one last beautiful insight that, uh, that I've held on to for some years from Pope Benedict. He says this, Some may object. Why not leave them in peace? They have their truth, and we have ours. Let us all try to live in peace, leaving everyone as they are, so they can best be themselves. But if we are convinced and have come to experience that without Christ, life lacks something, that something real, indeed the most real thing of all, is missing, we must also be convinced that we do no injustice to anyone if we present Christ to them, and thus grant them the opportunity of finding their truest and most authentic selves, the joy of finding life. Indeed, we must do this. It is our duty to offer everyone this possibility of attaining eternal life. A beautiful, beautiful insight and contrast between the world's sense of peace and authentic true peace, which is a restoration with God. Let's take a look at this text, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 through 4, and we'll leave it off at this with the epistle. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 through 4. Hebrews 12, 1 through 4. Brothers and sisters, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, think Jeremiah, let us rid ourselves of every burden and sin that clings to us and persevere in running the race that lies before us while keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus, the leader and perfecter of, of faith. For the sake of, of the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross, despising its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider how he endured such opposition from sinners in order that you may know that you may not grow weary and lose heart in your struggle against sin. You have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood. And there we have it. I think father Sebastian, I think we leave it with this text here that the cross is before us. Jesus willingly goes to the cross because of the joy of the resurrection, because he knows what is before him. We oftentimes lose that context in the bow. In, in the midst of the cross, we lose our vision of, of, of the purpose of what we're doing. Um, if we would keep our eye upon the goal, the prize, then all of the challenges and struggles that we face as Christians of telling the truth would fade away. And then when the persecution comes, we see it in its proper context as a sign of, of the ministry which God has given us uh, that, that must go through the cross to the day of the resur resurrection. As I've often I've said before, no one will rise from the dead who has not first died. We must be willing to die to our old selves that we might live in the newness of life which Christ has given us. To him be glory both now and ever and unto ages of ages. Amen. Three, six.